I'm Chad Main, the founder of legal services company Percipient, and this is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal technology and legal innovation. Today's episode, we're talking to an e-discovery OG, George Socha. He and I discuss the EDRM, the Electronic Discovery Reference Model. George Socha has been involved in electronic discovery for a long time. In fact, as we will hear, he's one of the co-founders of the EDRM, the Electronic Discovery Reference Model. George's current position is Senior Vice President of Brand Awareness at Reveal Data. Reveal is an e-discovery software company, and at Percipient, we're big fans of Reveal, and we use it on quite a few large-scale document reviews. The company is kind of starting to corner the market on AI, machine learning, and technology-assisted review in electronic discovery. Just last year in 2020, Reveal acquired NextLP, which is a tool legal and compliance team use to gain insight from unstructured and structured data. Just this year, Reveal also acquired Brainspace, which is a data analytics platform for investigations, e-discovery, intelligence mining, and compliance. Before we get into all this EDRM and e-discovery business, it's probably helpful if we talk about what e-discovery is. I'm sure many of you listeners are all too familiar with what electronic discovery is. But for those that don't know what it is, a little primer is probably helpful. In other countries like the UK, they call it e-disclosure. In America, the discovery phase during litigation is when the parties exchange information about the case that's relevant to the issues in dispute and will ultimately be used in evidence. Since the late 1990s and early into the 2000s, everything moved to the email and electronic documents away from paper, hence the name electronic discovery. Okay, and now on to the EDRM. Despite being an industry working group and kind of a think tank, at its heart, the EDRM was founded to create a working reference model for e-discovery projects. For lack of a better word, and as we will hear somewhat to George's chagrin, the EDRM is kind of like a flowchart that tracks the life of an e-discovery project from start to finish. On the left side of the EDRM, you have information governance, identification, and collection. That is where information is stored for an organization and where it is located and collected for use in a piece of litigation, an investigation, or some other legal matter. After the data is collected, you move to the middle of the EDRM, and that's where data is processed so it can be reviewed and analyzed. It's at that point you're looking at data to figure out what's relevant to the legal project that you're working on. Finally, after relevant information is analyzed and identified, we move to the right side of the EDRM. That's where information is produced and presented for use, like a trial. As mentioned, the EDRM has been around for quite a while, and George has been involved since the beginning. He wrote an article a few weeks ago that caught my attention. The article was entitled, After 15 Years, Has the EDRM Model Been Realized? The article has some great history about the group and also shows some cool prior iterations of the model itself. In the article, George talks about the fact that AI can pretty much be used at every phase of the EDRM. So he poses the question, with the introduction of AI, has the aim of the EDRM model been realized? So it's because of this article that I wanted to get George on the podcast. And we'll get to that in a second. But before we do... George and I talked about his background and how he got into e-discovery in the first place. To say that George has a pretty fascinating background is kind of an understatement. He was in the Peace Corps, he biked across Europe, and his dad ran a microscope repair company. What got you in e-discovery, though? Where, where did that come into, come into play? Um, I was a freshman in high school, and I had the good fortune to go to a small private high school in rural Wisconsin called Wayland Academy. They had um, what they called or described as a 414 program. So, four months of regular classes, one month of either short classes or create your own adventure classes, although they didn't call it that then. And then, four months of regular classes. That short month was in January. You know, my, my junior year, a group of us did a month long bike ride in Texas. My senior year, a group of us um, built a a building in the basement of the senior boys dorm uh, bricked, bricked it in with arches and all sorts of stuff. But my freshman year, I wasn't ready for any of that. I just looked at the courses available. And one of the options was a course in basic programming. Not basic in as in it's elementary, but basic as in that was the programming language. I took that class. That was my introduction to computers. I took another class, I think it was something like Advanced Basic and Pascal, my sophomore year. And that was the beginning and the end of my formal instruction in how to use computers. I spent an inordinate amount of time in high school writing code, 
we had a connection with a mainframe computer at a college not far away, Ripon College. It was an old PDP E11. You can look up online on YouTube and see one of these things in action. But we would write code by hand. And we would type it into the machine. The machine would kick out a yellow strip with holes punched in it. We would feed that yellow strip back into the machine. No video monitors. And either the program would run or it would not run. And if it did not run, we'd sit out. When we typed it in, it also printed out where we were typing in. We would sit down and manually work, run through the program as if we were the computers to try to figure out what wasn't working correctly. That's a really strong foundation in writing computer code. <laughs> right, yeah. Really strong. So, I, And that was how I entertained my, one of the ways I entertained myself we were a group of us in high school who did that. So how do you go from that interest in computers and you, you, you major in political science and ultimately law? Well, you know, I headed off to college, went to University of Wisconsin-Madison. I thought I was going to major in math, but clearly I wasn't serious about that because I signed up for or uh, applied for admission to a program that was capped out, I think, at 200 students a year or something like that called um, ILS, Integrated Liberal Studies. No math classes in that curriculum. And, and from there, I um, took a class in uh, political science, really liked it, really liked the professors, took more. And by my junior year, most of the poli-sci classes I were taking was graduate were graduate level classes. There were there was one undergrad and me who were in a lot of those classes, everyone else graduate students. I had nothing to do with computers in college. From college I headed off to West Africa was that where I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I didn't even have electricity to say anything about computers. Phenomenal experience, but nothing to do with computers. On my way back I did a roughly 4,500-mile bicycle ride from Paris to London via Venice, four months long, a great way to, to transition back to the U.S. And on my way, I stopped in to visit my middle brother, who was in Austria for the summer, He uh, writing a book called Inside the IBM PC. I got done with Peace Corps in 1983. PCs were still pretty new. Most people didn't know what to do with them or how to use them. He had with him, ironically, a compact luggable, not an IBM PC, that he was using to write this uh, book. And I looked at that machine and I thought, well, the world has changed while I was gone. Make sure I understand. He's writing a book about IBM on a compact? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I thought, wow, the world has changed while I was gone. I got back to the U.S., tried to figure out what to do next. It was a close call between applying to law school and applying to graduate school for international agricultural economics, a choice I'm sure many people make on a daily basis. Well, for reasons uh, that are too complicated to bother going into, I ended up applying to law schools. But, you know, there's a period of time in there. You're going to take the LSAT and actually figure out which law schools it's worth applying to. And I was only going to do this once, so I applied to a whole bunch of them. But along the way, I um, my father also had an IBM PC that he was using for his business, a microscope repair business. So I thought, I'll teach myself how to use this. Taught myself how to use it, how to use WordStar, which was the word processing program of the day. There were some other tools available. And among other things, I wrote a program to help him manage his inventory. He had tens of thousands of parts. So I wrote an inventory control program. I then, um, winter came. This is Wisconsin. I'd come from West Africa. Winter was a bad thing. I headed out with my youngest brother to Seattle. He was um, in his first year of graduate school getting a PhD in computer science. You can detect a theme here, perhaps. Uh, I spent some time in Seattle, and I was in Seattle in January of 1984 for the Seattle unveiling of the Apple Macintosh. Me and a whole big lecture hall full of computer scientists there for that unveiling. I think it was the next day 
maybe two days after that, probably not a week, that I went to the University of Washington bookstore with money borrowed from my mother and bought an Apple Macintosh. <laughs> so very first month of production. Do you still have it? No, no. Um, I But I took it with me to law school. And from there, I took it with me to the first law firm I was at. Ultimately, I donated it to a Montessori school that our kids were at. And they used that until the school shut down maybe seven, eight years ago, something oh, like wow. that. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it got a long, long, it had a long, long life. Um, when I showed up at law school, I was maybe not the only student with a computer, but one of very few. Um, I had, because I'd been a Peace Corps volunteer, I, I had very much a focus on the practical. Law school, especially an Ivy League law school, can be quite abstract. I wanted something tangible to do. So at the first opportunity, which was my second year, I got involved in the legal aid clinic. At some point along the way, after I'd gotten in, I was a student taking classes and participating in the legal aid clinic, IBM donated, a, IBM again, donated half a dozen PCs to the law school. The then Dean Peter Martin, who went on, by the way, to found um, uh, the Legal Information Inst, co-found with Peter Bruce, the Legal Inform, or with um, uh, Bruce Thomas, rather, the Legal Information Institute at Cornell, said at the time, we don't have a use for computers in the classroom, but maybe the legal aid clinic can use them. He handed them over to the legal aid clinic. The director of the legal aid clinic, Barry Strom, turned to me and said, you've got a computer. Maybe you can figure out what we can do with these. Um, and I wrote a sneakerware matter management system for the legal aid clinic to use first that half dozen PCs and then another half dozen that uh, IBM donated so that we ran the clinic on that sneakerware platform um, while I was there, at least my second and third year, or however long we had it. And I have no idea what happened to it afterwards. So I came out of law school with that experience, showed up at the first law firm I was at. They handed me a dictaphone, said, see how technologically advanced we are. And I went, I went oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> I brought my computer in in fairly short order and a steady stream of senior associates and junior partners came into my office one at a time. They'd walk in, close the door, sit down in the chair, and all um, delivered to me the same message, which boiled down to lose the computer. Real attorneys do not type. You will never be taken seriously as a lawyer if you have a computer on your desk. This was 1987. They had a point. Um, but I refused to lose the computer. Um, so a few things happened as a consequence, probably not uh, totally unrelated. I never did make partner at that law firm. <laughs> I did at a subsequent one. Um, but I got to know, we did have a computer science department, Wangs and Wang VS, if uh, you remember all of that, word processing um, capabilities and limited database capabilities. I spent enough time in uh, going over to the IT department that eventually someone decided that I should have oversight responsibility for the entire IT functions for the firm. And we also landed not long after I started at the firm, the largest set of cases the law firm ever would handle. There were going to be at least a million pages of documents, 1987 million pages, a lot of documents in those days, a big deal then. And that meant something needed to be done with them. It wasn't just going to be photocopies. Ultimately, the joint defense group decided to put together a committee to deal with this, I got uh, assigned to that committee and uh, because I had a computer on my desk. And we ultimately microfilmed those documents and had them code that content coded. We didn't call people reviewers in those days. We called them coders, but they did a lot of the same work. Um, and that coded content went into a database called BRS Search character-based system, limited functionality, what but it was this? 1987, 1988. Oh, so this is real, still, real early. Very early. 
And so I was involved in the design of the database and running of the operations and troubleshooting and overseeing the coders and all of that. We used a group called Rust Consulting for the coding. And they just happened to have offices not only in uh, uh, the DC area, which where they were, which is where their headquarters was, but in Minneapolis, just a couple blocks from our offices. And that's where the review work was all taking place. So on a regular and generally unannounced basis, I would show up at the review at the uh, where the, the reviewers or the coders were at work to see how things were going. A lot of spot checking and quality control that way. Um, I got to know through that, by the way, along the way, uh, Steve Shankroff, who recently passed away, who was over at Scadden. He was working for Rust at the time. I think he was a, co a review manager, I forget. Um, eventually, around 19, somewhere between 1991 and 1993, I don't remember, we got at the law at that law firm the first of the e-discovery projects. Did you get these because of your prior experience with that case? That with the well, no, it was a case. Uh, one of the f we did primarily defense work, but this was a plaintiff side case, and the partner managing the case uh, figured out that there was data in a computer somewhere. And the company on the other side of the company he was suing had an IT director. So he came to me and he said, you've got a computer on your desk. You're in charge of the IT function in this law firm. You're a lawyer. Go down to wherever it was, Kansas City or Missouri, I forget which, and take this guy's deposition. Find out everything you can about their IT systems so we can find the hidden gold in their data. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I went down there. I mean, I... First, in preparation, I, I found at that time I was only able to identify two providers in the country that focused on e-discovery, both of them in Seattle. And what, what did they call it then? Was it, was it um, called electronic discovery? It, didn't have, it did not have a standardized name at that point. Some people were calling it electronic discovery, other people calling it data discovery, electronic evidence discovery. And the two uh, providers out there were EED, John Jessen's group, electronic evidence discovery, and then CFI, Computer Forensic Sync, also in Seattle. I wanted to hire one of them to help me. The partner in charge said, nope, no doing. We don't have the budget for that. You figure it out. <laughs> well, I didn't figure it out so well. I went down and took the worst deposition of my career. <laughs> I did pretty much everything wrong that you could possibly do wrong for an e-discovery deposition. And that's how my e-discovery career was launched. I mean, obviously it turned into a very fruitful career. What was it about that deposition that was so wrong? Um, I, I didn't know at that time. I just didn't know how little an IT director in that size of, orga of an organization would know about the day-in, day-out operations of the IT systems. I did not appreciate the complexity of the systems. I didn't know enough about the different types of uh, ways that data would be created and stored how to get access to that data, where it would be available, where it wouldn't be available, what might be available from backup tapes and how. I, I did know about backup tapes by then because of my responsibility overseeing our own uh, IT operations. But there was so much I didn't know to ask about and there was almost nowhere to turn at the time for guidance. You had to make it all up yourself. So you go from there, you have, a, I don't call it a bad experience, but a suboptimal. <laughs> well, I thought it was a suboptimal experience, but I got tagged as the guy who knew e-discovery. So that was, so that answers my next question was like, okay, so how did you, why did you keep on keeping on with e-discovery? So I tried not to. <laughs> <laughs> I kept saying, no, 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 I don't want to do this. Don't make me do this. This is not why I went to law school. I want to be a trial lawyer. I want to try lawsuits. I don't want to do this e-discovery or whatever it is stuff. Don't make me. 
well, you know, I was an associate. I yeah, got to do what you're told to do. So, so it becomes a thing, and then so it became a thing. I built out uh, our lit support and e-discovery functions at that law firm in 1996. That law firm collapsed. It was one of the first major law firm collapses. We went from I forget. I think we had about 300 lawyers in four U.S. offices. We had three overseas alliances, and we went from that to nothing in an 18-month period. And then what? Do you, what's next on for you? Halfway through that 18-month period, 28 of us uh, lawyers and then probably about an equal number of staff left that law firm and started a new one. Two lawyers joined us from elsewhere. I planned out working with a, a, a fair number of res- external resources I planned out the ITR infrastructure for that law firm. And um, day one, when we launched, we did not have a piece of furniture. We were using cardboard boxes as desks, and we were sitting on the floor. We did have space. We did not have... um, Someone brought coffee machines from home. that's, That's what we had. But we did have laptops for all the lawyers. PCs for all the staff. We had a functioning network. We had email addresses. We had word processing capabilities. We were able to get work out the door day one, even though we were propping our computers up on cardboard boxes. When we come back, George talks about the genesis of the EDRM. This podcast is brought to you by Percipient, a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal teams tackle legal operations, electronic document review, and process automation. Percipient services include managed document review, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and also helps legal teams provide clients with process-driven legal support. To learn more, visit percipient.co. Percipient. Legal services powered by technology. We'll get back to my talk with George in just a second. But I wanted to let you know that you can subscribe to Technically Legal on pretty much every major podcasting platform. And while you're there, if you like us enough, I hope you give us a review. If you want to get a hold of me, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Twitter or email me at cmain at percipient.co. Also, for every episode of Technically Legal, we have a dedicated episode page where I put more information about our guests and links to some of the stuff we talked about. Like for today's episode, I'm going to include a link to that article on the EDRM that George wrote and also more information about Reveal his current company, in the EDRM itself. Okay, let's get back to my talk with George Sosha, where he discusses the beginnings of the EDRM. In 2003, end of 2002, I finally decided that it was time for me to get out of a law firm. Really not the right type of place for me. Um, the folks at the law firm were surprised by my decision at first, but didn't disagree with me either. <laughs> uh, and helped me get launched on a consulting practice, which I um, started in 2003, mid-2003. mid The very first project I I was asked to do by a client was a survey of the e-discovery space. I needed some help. I knew Tom um, from when I was at the first law firm. Tom Geldman. Tom Geldman. And I contacted Tom and said, have I got a deal for you? I've been asked to do a survey of the e-discovery space. They're paying me hardly anything, so I can pay you even less. Their time frame is impossibly short. There's no way we're going to meet it. Their expectations are incredibly high. We can't meet those either. Are you in or not? (laughs) And Tom said, well, a deal like that, how can I say no? We did that, and we continued that survey. That was 2003. We continued that survey through 2009. One of the things we kept hearing, though, when we were talking with people, because we interviewed a lot of people for the survey, and we heard this especially from the provider side, was, you two guys, you don't know what e-discovery is. Let us tell you. It's what we do. And who was telling you this? Well, so if it was an organization that processed data, they would tell us, The true e-discovery is processing data. If it was an organization that hosted it, that was the true e-discovery. If it was a group that provided reviewers, that was the true e-discovery. And we looked at each other and said, that can't be right. Those can't all be true. Obviously, there's a lot of confusion out there. 
So let's see if we can pull together a group of people and we'll put together a one-year project and see if we can answer this. And for want of a better name, Tom had an IT background, I a legal background. We called it um, the electronic discovery reference model. He'd worked in reference models. So, so that was the name from the get-go. Models. Yep. And it wasn't, we didn't create an entity or anything like that. We just created, launched an activity, if you will. And the name was not randomly chosen, but that's how we came up with the name. We wanted a reference model. That's what we wanted to build. And it was about e-discovery. So we called it the discovery reference model, EDRM, because that's shorter than trying to say the whole thing. We convened, I think it was about 35 people, I forget, at a meeting in St. Paul in May of 2005. And how did you find these people? How did you select them? How did you get a hold of them? Primarily from my address book. We contacted people I knew, people I'd spoken with at conferences, people I'd worked with in one way or another, people I knew had some experience with electronic discovery and some interest. And then there were people who contacted us as well. So there were people we invited, people who heard about it, who asked to join. At the meeting, had you and Tom already started to map out what the process or the kind of flow was going to look like? Well, well, no and yes. We had drawn up some objectives, big picture objectives. We wanted to put together a reference model. We wanted it to be something that would help people better understand what e-discovery is and what its major components were and what to do about them. I had something I had been working on for years for no special reason. It started out as a workflow. It started out as hundreds of steps. This is how I do e-discovery, and this is what I see other people doing. And I did it in PowerPoint just because that was the tool I had available. So it was, I don't know how many linked slides in PowerPoint, but I kept pairing it back and pairing it back. And by the time we had that meeting, I had paired it back to a single slide, which looked very much like the current EDRM diagram. You can see you can see different iterations of the uh, post on, on the reveal. Um, yeah, I should point that out. I should point that out. The impetus for me getting on the, on the podcast was you wrote a blog post uh, on reveal. Uh, and I'll put a link to that on the episode page. Yeah, it's called After 15 Years Has the eDiscovery eDRM Model Been Realized? And if you go through, you can see some of the history of, of uh, eDRM, including early versions of the eDRM diagram. So the first version up there, that's what I had that I'd been working on. It looks a lot like the eDRM diagram, but a little different. It's pretty close, though. And I should say for a lot of people listening will know what the eDRM is. Some won't. So I should... And we'll put a picture of that, obviously, on the episode page, too. But I should say, for lack of a better word, it, it's a flow chart. Would you call it a flow chart? You know, it looks like a flow chart. But it shouldn't. That One of my regrets is that I made it look like a flow chart. But I still don't have a better way of describing it. So let's talk about these stages, though. So in the, for lack of a better word, we'll call a flow chart, you've got, on the left, you've got the identification. Um, then you've got preservation and collection. You've got processing and review and analysis, and then production towards the end, and at the very end, you know, use of this evidence and trial presentation. Those are kind of the stages. But why do you regret? Why do you regret calling it a flowchart or, or positioning it as a flowchart? So it was meant from the beginning, and we tried to describe it from the beginning as a conceptual framework. And the reason for that is that while the steps that are the, as they are laid out re- represent a fairly typical way that people work through any discovery process. There is no one set way to do these things. And what you need to do will vary from one matter to another. You might not even do all of these steps. And you will do additional things that don't show up here. In addition, and this is why all those lines with the arrows, it's not like you have one pass through and you're done. It's not a waterfall model where you stop, start at the top, you drop back down, but you're never a salmon swimming up the waterfall. Um, it's iterative. So you might preserve some data, process it, 
So you can start looking at it. You process it at some level so you can look at it. Realize as you're looking at it that there's more data you need to go out and gather. You're back to the identification stage. You go grab some more data. While you're grabbing the more data, you might continue to work with the data you had initially. You might push some of that up to review. You might analyze it in other ways. You might be doing these things simultaneously. You might have several different workflows going all on all at once. And you will continue to do this overall cycle throughout the life of a matter. So instead of having one workflow, you could say, well, we're doing the entire EDRM cycle here at the beginning when we're figuring out what to do about the legal hold. And then we're doing the entire EDRM cycle as we preserve data. And we're doing the entire EDRM cycle as we're working up for depositions. And we're even going through a small, rapid version of it in the middle of trial. But people tend to look at this and think, oh, well, first to identify data, I identify data. Then I'm done with that. And I preserve what I identified. Then I'm done with that. And really, preservation and collection, aren't they the same thing? They're not, but that's... Right, right. And you, you, you alluded to it. There's different shapes and arrows. What are the significance of those, and why were they chosen? Well, they all started as... Um, the shapes all started as rectangles. No special reason, just because that was an object shape in PowerPoint. <laughs> that's all. You make a rectangle. That's all. Um, eventually, we changed the first element, which started out with the name records retention, ultimately has become information um, governance. And I changed, we changed that shape from a rectangle to a circle. And I've got a bit about that in the blog post as well. And that goes back to my early days. And if you scroll down from that in that blog post, you'll see a, a picture of a flow charting template. That that is, that's the flow charting template, not that specific one, but one just like that, that I used in high school as, as we were um, writing things. And when we had a routine or a process, often it would start either with an oval or a circle and end with that. Because in many ways, information governance is the beginning and ending of any e-discovery exercise we changed the shape from a rectangle to a circle. The other reason we changed it is that in the interim, we had created the information governance reference model, and that is circular in shape. So we wanted it, that, that visual tie there. And when did you draw the distinction, or not distinction, but kind of reclassify records retention into information government. Oh, let's see. I'm not sure about the timing on that. I'd have to go back and look. I remember why we made the changes, but I don't remember the exact dates. Originally, we called it records retention um, and then records management, I think, by the time we had the first version of the EDRM diagram out there. What happened, though, was records managers were coming, were saying, well, this piece of this data, we didn't declare it a record. And so you can't touch it for rediscovery purposes. <laughs> it's like, well, wait a minute, that's not what we meant. Obviously, there's been a miscommunication here, and it's uh, the fault is on our end. Yeah, tell that to the judge. It's, uh, right, yeah, exactly. It ain't going to fly. So we changed it to information management because that was the term that was most popular at the time. We debated information management versus information governance. Information governance hadn't caught on. But over time, that shifted information governance became the dominant term. So we renamed it information governance. The model after the, the meetings in May of 2005, you unveiled the first version in June of 06. Right. January of 06, actually. January 1st, 2006, New Year's Day. I lifted if I lifted all of the password protection, I had all I had the entire website built, had all the pages in place, but they were all password protected. So only our participants could see it. And I told everyone I was going to do this on January 1st, and nobody believed me. I pulled all the restrictions and restrictions on January 1st, and there was this cry of angst from across the country. <laughs> we're not ready yet. <laughs> Like, too bad, it's here. But had you not done that, it would never be. Absolutely. No one would be ready for content like that ever to be published. Which leads to another question. Since that 1-1-2006 date, how many official revisions has the 
EDR have gone through? So the content has constantly been under uh, you know, uh, development. It's constantly getting added to and changed. So there's not a revision number like that for the content. Um, the diagram has probably changed four or five times. If you go to the EDRM website, there's a page on the website, I think, still there that shows the major different versions of the diagram. But all still pretty close from your original vision. All still pretty close. And the reason, one of the reasons for that is that it has been successful beyond anything that Tom and I could possibly have imagined when we started this. This, this diagram, this framework is used everywhere in the world. So changes, we felt that changes should be made only with the greatest of care. I don't want everyone to have to redo their decks. I don't want to have to have them rebuild their products. I don't want to have to ha have them have to redo their workflows just because we decide to rename a box or something like that. And I know a few years ago, you and Tom sold EDRM. What was behind that? What's the current state for the organization? Oh, oh, the reasons were simple. Tom retired or wanted to retire. His wife had retired. She decided it was time for him to retire as well. Uh, Tom's 10 years older than me. Um, so he decided he wanted to retire. I did not want to try to run EDRM on my own. We had tried without success to bring in other people along the way to run it with us. Um, I wanted to, we wanted to find an institutional home for EDRM. And I also felt like I had taken it as far as I had it within me to take it. It was time for someone else to take over. Um, we uh, were put in touch with Duke. They were quite interested. Once we started talking, we pretty quickly uh, figured out how to make this work. And they took over um, EDRM from us. They had it for about four years, decided that um, they were going a different direction, didn't have the resources available to maintain and expand it the way they felt it should be maintained and expanded, looked for a new home. And at that time, uh, Kaylee and Mary were looking for, Kaylee Walstead and Mary Mack, who had been with ASEDS, were looking for a new thing to do. So the timing worked. Once again, a question of timing. The timing worked out well, and it is now in their very capable hands. And what's your current involvement? Uh, I've got an advisory role. I work on some of the projects, um, and I try to avoid getting in their way. <laughs> <laughs> Title of your article was, was or has EDRM been realized? Do you think it has? I think that the key change that has happened since we first created the model and what people could do then and what can be done today has been the introduction of artificial intelligence, however you want to define it, into this whole process. There are things now, the tools such as Reveal's tool, both the review platform and the Next LP side of things can do that make many parts of this model achievable in ways that they really weren't when we got started. Everything was manual when we first got started with this. Now, tools like that put the power, can put the power of e-discovery. Because I think of e-discovery as an opportunity rather than a chore and a burden. I agree. They can put the power of e-discovery in the hands of the people who really need it. And that's the practicing lawyers, the litigators and trial lawyers. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you point that out because it is a lot of times it is burdensome, expensive, especially if it's not done right. But it's very important because at the end of the day, that's where the facts of the dispute come from. You know, that's where you're going to learn what's going on. You have to find out what happened. You have to tell it. You have to build and tell a persuasive story and a more persuasive one than the other side's story. Hence, the over and often overlooked presentation box at the end of the diagram. Ultimately, you got to put that data, some part of that data in front of an audience, either to try to get more information or to try to persuade someone. And the article you just brought up, the AI is kind of the, one of the major points of the article. But your, your point is this, that AI basically can fit in at almost every stage now. Uh, and not just basically can fit in, it 
does fit in at every stage now. Maybe not presentation, but everywhere else it fits in. Well, at some level, it does impact presentation because it's how you get there. It's how, how it gets there. So, yeah. It impacts it. Yeah. But, but, but I don't know of any AI-powered tools right. that are used right. for the actual presentation of the data. So maybe not in that stage or that part, but every other part of this diagram, both the objects, if you will, the rectangles and the circle, and the lines, which are you know, the, the emphasis on going back to earlier stages, the emphasis on iterative cycles. Do you think that the, the model itself warrants any kind of revision to reference AI or to incorporate AI? No, I don't think so. And here's why. Um, and I did a, a session on this with some other folks that uh, I forget whether it was maybe Relativity Fest or I forget where it was a couple of years ago, um, where I put on the, I started putting up on the screen all the things people have suggested should be added to the model over the years. And then I started taking out of the model all the things people suggested should be taken out. And what you ended up with was no component of the EDRM diagram left up there. And probably because there was only so much room on one slide, 20 or so other things up there that aren't on the diagram. It's a diagram. A diagram is a type of map. A map's a value only if it focuses on certain things but doesn't show you everything. And, and to your point, you still got to go through these motions. Just AI is just a different way of getting there. Right. It's a, it's a grease that makes this wheel turn much better than it ever could before. In the article, uh, you mentioned that historically review has taken a lot of budget and a lot of resources in the, in, in the model. And, and if the model were to scale, the, the part, the review part, the review box would be huge. It would shove everything else out of sight. I couldn't even resize it that way and have it meaningful in the article other than just put up one big blue box. You, you do point out, though, um, that AI can help there because obviously it can cut down on what you need to review. And maybe, you know, if it's trained right and it's sophisticated enough, cut down on a, a lot of human review, period. Right. So much of how people approach e-discovery today is with a huge amount of energy and emphasis focused on cutting things away. How do we get rid of the stuff we don't want to look at so that we can then manually go through what's left? AI-driven technologies, like NextLP does a great job of this, I think, um, give you the ability to leapfrog past that. Don't worry about that. Instead, begin focusing right away on trying to find the things that are going to be of use and of value to you. Put money to deliver value instead of money just to take out the garbage. You still need a human to confirm what the AI is pushing out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've, got a, I've got another post up on um, the Reveal site about um, uh, really how AI should be something that superpowers humans, not replaces them. Yeah, this is it should be this incredible exoskeleton we strap on that lets us do things we could never accomplish before. Like how the chess players are better when you combine humans and computers and play each other. Exactly. Yep. Human plus computer beats human or computer every day of the week. Absolutely. Kasparov. Um, yeah. Going back to your point about how the, a lot of times the current focus, and, and, and rightly so, is to try to winnow down what the actual manual human reviewers have to look at to try to push that review piece down. But that's a good thing, though. And in, in, in the end, we have, to, we have to cut the costs of e-discovery. It's too expensive. It, it's become unaffordable, not just in small cases, but in large cases, the way people tend to do it today. So we have to change what we do. We have to cut the costs. We have to bring them back in alignment with the overall value and expense, however you want to look at it, of a dispute. You can't spend $5 million in discovery costs on a $1 million dispute. You know, I will say, since I launched the company in 2014, we're obviously involved in some large-scale document reviews. I will say people involved are, very, are more sensitive to that fact now, and they are better at actually 
realizing they need to get that data set down and, and sensitive to cost. So I think the the review, the size of review is is coming down, but hopefully with AI pushing it even to another level, you can get it even even less. Yeah, and I, I, and we can. I mean, I have no question about that because I've seen it. I've seen it done. I know it can be done. In another way, AI is helpful. It will bring down review costs or just e-discovery costs in general. And you, you touch on this in your article too is you can reuse models for similar types of cases. Explain how that works. That's one of the ways that can have a huge impact. So if, for example, you take a look at the next LP model library or library of models, these are pre-created pieces that you can deploy immediately and then modify after that so that in a very short period of time, we just did this exercise for a showcase yesterday that the, the greater Texas chapter of ACEDS put on. You can very, very quickly, if, if you're lucky, um, hone in on what you're really looking for. And explain how that works. Explain how that works. So if you've set up a model, let's just talk about compliance. As I know it's helpful in compliance. We we use it in compliance. Um, you get the similar types of issues that the compliance officers are looking for. So how does it transfer between case one to case two to case three? So there are a couple. Of, I won't try to go into the details because I can't really adequately explain them in the time we've got right now or probably even adequately explain them fully at all. But the models are developed using two somewhat different approaches. Um, it's not keyword searches. It's much more complex than that, um, making use of AI capabilities to try to go and find content that match whatever criteria are built in. So that if you are looking for um, some sort of, you've got a workplace uh, harassment situation, part of what's built into the model is looking for content that has um, emotional over or undertones of certain types. So it's, it's, it's using sentiment analysis to try to figure out who is angry, for example, or, ang or, or, or something like that. They're built using a lot of data to model on. And then you can take that same model and deploy it against new data. So it's already got an idea of the types of things it's trying to find before it's looked at any data. So uh, think of it almost like if, if you're used to uh, predictive coding, think of it as kind of like you've gone through a whole predictive coding exercise, not just once, but 500 times. And you've taken what you've learned through going through that predictive coding exercise many, many times, packaged it all up, and you've done it on a lot of you know, harassment lawsuits, you package it up, and on the next lawsuit, you draw on all that prior experience to apply it in the new not lawsuit against the data that you have available. That's that's a good way. That's a good way of presenting that. You're you're reusing work product. You know, you learned it once, and now you're going to use it again, and again, and again. Well, George, thanks for your time. It's been a great conversation. If people want to get a hold of you, how do they do that? They can reach me via email. G-S-O-C-H-A at revealdata.com. They can reach me uh, via mobile or text at 651-336-3940. And they can always reach me through LinkedIn uh, as well. So that's a wrap for today's conversation. As always, we really appreciate you listening. If you want to learn more about our guests and find other episodes, you can find us on the web at tlpodcast.com. Until next time, this has been Technically Legal.